Welcome to the Talk with Clouds podcast. Your host is Katie Ann, an island girl on a journey with her guests to learn about their backgrounds, businesses, passions, experiences, life lessons, and wins. Come and laugh, cheer, learn, and plan with us. My friend, take some time to come and talk with Clads. Do you want to provide a memorable experience at your event? Book Pinbounce at 561-727-5488. Pinbounce offers bounce houses, cotton candy machines, tables, chairs, and other event services in Palm Beach County, Florida. We offer all you need in one place. Follow us on social media using at Pin Bounce and to book your event, call us at 561-727-5488. Remember, we put the P in party with the Pin Bounce touch. Go Pin Bounce! Hello world, welcome to Talk With Clads. My name is Katie Ann and I will be your host for today. We have a special, 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 extra special. You see how many specials I gave you, Roland? So doc, his name is Dr. Roland Joseph. Dr. Joseph is a recent graduate of Nova Southeastern University, where he successfully earned a PhD in conflict analysis and resolution. He is going to discuss what his dissertation topic was with us. Dr. Joseph has an interest in conducting research in the non-killing paradigm and nuclear weapons issues. He is a member of the Research Committee in Non-Killing Security and International Relations at the Center for Global Non-Killing. He was also a former journalist and political analysis in Haiti for numerous radio radio stations. You hear my accent coming out and newspapers for over 15 years. He was also a former instructor of Introduction to Political Science, and he has also coordinated and led training sessions on peace, nonviolence, non-killing, and conflict resolution at Haiti's Caribbean Center for Global Nonviolence and Sustainable Development. Dr. Joseph, welcome to Talk with Clad. We're so excited to have you today. Thank you, Kenyan Pinard. It is a great pleasure to be with you today. So I'm here to, to, to answer your questions about my experience promoting non-killing paradigm in Haiti, in the United States, and I here to share my experience conducting research in the field of non-killing studies and as part of my dissertation. Okay. So congratulations on completing your PhD. I know that is an extraordinary accomplishment, Dr. Joseph. And let's see, what is your, or what was your dissertation topic? My dissertation topic was about the ch- the challenge transformative experience of promoting non-killing political science to entire nuclear weapon activist realist. Oh wow, that, that that's a big situation. That's a big topic that you took on. That that's really a big topic. <laughs> So I would really like for our listeners to hear about your story and how your background played a part in that story. So tell us a little bit about your background growing up in Haiti and what role did your parents play in your pursuit of your education? Great question. So I think I was born in Haiti and grew up in Haiti. I am uh, the second child of in, in a family of five uh, children. So um, I studied political science in Haiti. I mean, I would say that my bachelor's degree and I have a certificate in journalism and communication. So my career, I work of, for, for, for all of my entire life, I work as a journalist, reporter, newsroom director in Haiti, writer, and then that's it for Haiti. So I used to work too as a community organizer in Haiti for the organization that you just mentioned, the Center for Global Nonviolence and and Sustainable Development. So um, that was what I did when I was in Haiti. And I have to mention that my parents, (laughs) my mother, my dad, they are all educated 
people. They, 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 they had no chance as I had to go to, to school. And I can tell you that my mother, my father, they can't even identify the names. That is sad. But what is important is they, they knew that they had to, to, to push us to, to, to push us to go to school. They encourage us to go to school and Caribbean parents or even people from my country, they want their children to go to school, yeah. the new generation. So I have to thank my, my family for that. But when I moved to the United States in, in October 2013, I, 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 I keep studying, pursuing my study here. And I got, a, as you mentioned, a master's degree in peace and conflict studies from the University of Massachusetts Lowell, where before I began my PhD at Nova Southeastern University. University. Okay. So you were one of five. Your parents were uneducated, but they saw the need or the importance of an education. And then you mentioned that you've been a journalist. You were a journalist for multiple news stations, right? So what what made you decide to become a journalist when you were in Haiti? <laughs> That's a good question. So that was a, a long history. When I was in high school, I remember I had three friends, two classmates. We used to organize our class in a way, and then we tried to do... To, to, to read the news about what happened in the world and in Haiti. So we, we talk as a journalist, like, let me say that in French. Madame, monsieur, bonsoir, bienvenue à notre émission, something like that. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We used to do that, to, to do that in, in school, in high school. So that was my first motiv motivation. And then second, I think I used to hear some famous Haitian journalists like Valérie Numa, Dalival, Nancy Walk, Haitian journalists, they, they inspired me to, to become a journalist. Mm -hmm. And it is very difficult in Haiti when, when you are young, like a teenager, and you decide, you said, okay, you know what, mommy, I'm going to study journalism. Your parents will not let you study journalism. They will encourage you to study medicine. Uh -huh. they, to, to, they want you to become economist, engineer, other prestigious, I mean, profession, you know. They're not, my mother didn't want, want me to study journalism. What is that? You are not going to make money. Oh. So oh. Uh, that was my <laughs> choice. I yeah. wanted to become a journalist and I'm, I'm, I, it was a good thing for me. So when I moved to the United States in, 19, in, in 2013, it was, I said, Ola, you have to be in academia, okay? Because it is difficult to make a living in the United States as a journalist because oh. I wasn't born here. So I tried to, 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 to another career. I, I want to choose another career. Another but, career. Uh, okay. Yeah. So can you share any interesting or impactful experiences from your journalism career that helped to shape your interest in conflict resolution? Oh, this is interesting. Uh, <laughs> I would say, yeah, because I'm by nature a peaceful man. Mm -hmm. I'm by nature a peaceful man. I love peace. And in my profession, I prioritize communication. Emotion, peace studies is about communication. So even I prioritize in the community, dialogue, peaceful means of addressing conflict. That's what I used to, I used to do. I, I, I can't remember a specific anecdote that can, that I can tell you pushing me toward the, the, the field of peace and conflict studies and communication. But I wanted also to be a political analyst because when you study journalism, you are not only a simple, I would say, reporter or a writer. You can be also a political analyst and editorialist so many times. So the political science I studied helped me to 
to analyze political issues, not only in my country, Haiti, but also in, in the United States, in America, in Asia, whatever happening in the world, actually, even in the world, I can analyze that in my talk show. Yeah. And some radio stations used to invite me to 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 analyze, for example, the U.S. election, presidential election, the French presidential election. I used to 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 give my take on this different talk shows, you know what I mean? So there's a, I, I try, I make connection between political science and journalism and even with the field of peace and conflict resolution studies. Okay. So then how did your experiences in Haiti shape your perspective on conflict, violence, and nonviolence? I can tell you the story my professor, Dr. Max, he passed away, unfortunately, in 2017, you know, 2014 or 2015, something like that. I don't remember exactly the date. So he introduced some concept in, to his students. At the time, I was student in political science. Concepts like nonviolence, peace. You know what I mean? Non-violence, peace, and even non-killing. And it was in, in 2004, 2004, 2005. And that was where I first heard about the concept of non-killing political science. And then he was my anthropology professor. He became my friend. And then I became a member of his Center for Global Non-Violence and Sustainable Development. I I received training trainer at his center. And then that was where I, at that time, I, I, I became a trainer in the field of nonviolence, peace, conflict resolution. And then I started training other young people in high school and even organizing some training for community in the field of peace, conflict resolution, dispute resolution. So that, uh, that, that, that is the beginning of my, I mean, experience with conflict resolution. Okay. So what led to you pursuing a PhD? Can you repeat it? What led to you pursuing your PhD? Yeah, when I moved to the United States in in 2013, I went to the University of Massachusetts Lowell. I had no intention to 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 get a PhD in conflict resolution. That was not my 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 goal. So after finishing my thesis, and I I I, I talked to a professor. I said, "Well, then, okay." Academia in the United States is difficult, but I think you can do it. So I began to explore the field of different programs in conflict resolution in the U.S. And I applied at Nova Southeastern University, and I have been accepted there. And then I, I got my PhD here So in conflict resolution. So I'm so happy for this journey. And then some of my, some of my professors... They, they pass away. So I think they would be happy about this achievement. Yeah, yeah. Th- that's really, ro- Dr. Joseph, a, an amazing achievement to, to have your Absolutely. PhD. So while you, you got accepted into NOVA, and what, like, what, why did you choose this dissertation topic? Did you have another topic? How did you settle on this specific topic? And the, I started the program in 2018. So a professor suggested, Roland, you have to, you need your topic before even you start. I said, okay. And I take, okay, Roland, why don't you continue on non killing Because I have, I had the opportunity to share this concept, non-killing, political science or non-killing to other students, even in Haiti at the University of Massachusetts. Students so used to challenge me by asking questions. I would say not stupid questions, but they used to say, ah, non-killing is something that is 
unthinkable, like this utopia. They, they used to tell me things that can discourage me. But there's someone who told me, Roland, you know what? Non killing is a great, great topic to pursue at Nova Southeastern University because it is new. Yeah. Not all people know it. Yes. It is an original topic. You have to do it. Okay. That's why. Yeah. That's why you I, chose I, that. Yeah. So when, when you get is what most of my homework, I did most of my homework based on my topic, either non killing political science or nuclear disarmament. I will tell you more about that later. But if my professor gives me homework, a book with you, email them and ask them, dear professor, can I use this topic? Can I use this book? Can I write my essay on a topic related to my topic, <laughs> to my dissertation topic, yeah. which is non-killing nuclear disarmament? And that's why when I finished my dissertation, with my coursework, it was a difficult for me to just go forward. Because so you I already guess. had the research exactly. information exactly. already. Exactly. I all the all, all of my paper written here, just reading. I do not I did not copy and paste, but just yeah. I I had I had a clear idea of what I wanted to do. Yeah. That's an actually great advice. <laughs> and very, very smart. So how do you define, because you said the concept of non-killing, it's there, but it's not very popular. So how do you define non-killing and what distinguishes it from other forms of non-violence? Um, to define non-killing, I would say non-killing political science right, or non-killing global society, we have to mentioned the name of Glenn DePage, the scholar, the American scholar who created, who coined this concept. Who was Page? Page was an American political scientist. He developed this concept in, I would say, 1974. Three words came to him. Three words has or have transformed him. Those words are no more killing. No more killing. <laughs> Why no more killing? No more killing because Page used to kill. He was a U.S. soldier. Oh, that's interesting. He served, he served as a soldier in the Korean War, I think in 1950, 1952. Page Edian even defended war. He was for war. In other words, Page was for killing. Page was for violence. Mm -hmm. He had voted for violence because he had been trained as a soldier. So how did he get to non-killing? In 1974, three words came to him. Three words have transformed page, no more killing. And then this transformation will lead him to create the concept of non-killing. He spent, I would say, 30 years conducting research on this concept. He asked a question, a simple question. He said, is a non-killing global society possible? Is it possible to achieve a society in which there is no weapon made or created to kill? That was his question. He spent 30 years conducting this research by interviewing political scientists, the mentoring political scientists. Mm -hmm those who believe in, in the philosophy of, for example, Plato, Aristotle, Thomas, Thomas Hobbes, Max Weber, those thinkers, political thinkers, they all defend killing in politics. They believe that, like Machiavelli, Niccolò Machiavelli, 
They believe that killing is normal in politics. And finally, the answer of Page to his simple question is, yes, it is possible to achieve a society where there is no weapon to kill. A non-killing society for Page is a society where a, so a community local to global where there is no weapon made to kill, no condition conducive depend open the threat of killing with, with, with weapon. This kind of society includes also nuclear weapons. And that's why I, and I try to connect non the, the concept of non-killing with that. Okay. So then can you elaborate on the role of anti-nuclear weapon activists and realists in promoting non-killing? How do their personal perspectives and actions contribute to a broader movement? Yeah. Let me, the first reason that I, I was interested in conducting my research on non-killing and anti-nuclear weapon activists, anytime I raised this concept in class or with friends, with colleagues, with other scholars, researchers, I said, well, and non-killing society is impossible. It is not possible. Mm -hmm. And they say, you know why? Because one of the reasons they, 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 they put forward is the risk of killing associated with the existence of nuclear weapons. And that is one of the reasons I try to connect that, to investigate the experience of scholars at the Center for Global Non-Killing as they promote this concept to others, including anti-nuclear weapon activists and realists. And then an anti-nuclear weapon activist is someone who advocates for the elimination of nuclear weapons. An anti-nuclear weapon activist is not necessarily for the elimination of all weapons like in like a non-killing activist. Right. A non-killing activist is for the elimination of all weapons, including anti-nuclear nuclear weapons. Okay. But a realist is for the existence. They believe, realists believe that force is necessary. War is necessary. We have to prepare for war. Like we, like a, an, uh, an old adage, Cipis in a, 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 a Latin, an old adage that say, says, Cipis passem palabellum. Cipis passem palabellum, the Latin old adage. If you want peace, prepare for war. If you want peace, prepare for war. Cipis passem pala. Palabellum, that is realist. We have to, we, we need military, we need army, mm -hmm. we need to prepare to kill. So I used to say, civis passem, pala passem, which means if you want peace, prepare for peace. <laughs> or if you want peace, prepare for non killing peace. Hence, the need to educate the society, the global society, from page perspective, Kerian. Page said, People kill in politics. They do. They kill in politics because they have been trained to kill. So to not kill, we have to train people to not kill. That's why the, this new paradigm, the non-killing paradigm is important. If you start educating young people, educating kids, educating professors about the concept of non-killing, killing leaders. Yeah. Imagine, okay, go ahead. No, no, so I was going to ask you, because when you talk about politics and killing, non-killing, right? Because war is a big business. Mm -hmm. So what were some of the ethical or moral or philosophical arguments that you used to support the promotion of non-killing or you would use to support the, the promotion of non-killing to someone who is a realist? Absolutely. Usually, people from the realist school, they put forward the economic scarcity that leads to conflict and they respond to them in one word. A non-killing global society 
is not a society free of conflict, but a society in which human beings will not use violence and killing to address conflict. Because conflict is inherent to human beings. But we have the capacity to not use violence, to not use force to address conflict. We have this capacity. You have it. I have it. And Page used to say, the majority of human beings are not killers. The majority of human beings are not violent. That is one of the, the arguments developed, developed by Page in his seminal book, Non-Killing Global Political Science, which is translated in, into more than 34 languages, including Haitian Creole. And I had the opportunity to translate this book from French version to Haitian Creole. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, Dr. Joseph, in your research, did you encounter any resistance or skepticism towards the concept of non-killing? And how did you address or navigate these challenges? As I conducted my research? Yeah. 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 Well, first of all, the challenge I met was not, can I say challenge, but I, I interviewed the non-killing I would say people in the field of non-killing. That's why it wasn't challenging. Okay. The challenge was at the level of finding or uh, the right participant to answer my research question or my interview questions. That was the challenge. It was sometimes difficult to find him because it was not like about non-killing, only about non-killing, but it's still about non-killing and nuclear disarmament. But at the center, it might be difficult to find appropriate respondents or scholars who are used to promote specifically the concept of non-killing to anti-nuclear weapon activists and realists. So I addressed that by reviewing my the protocol, the RB protocol, and contacting my my chair. And then I tried to make it a easier <laughs> for me to find appropriate respondents for my research. So I, 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 I included scholars who used to promote nonviolence. Nonviolence is, is a concept related to, to, to non-killing, but, but nonviolence is more complicated to understand than killing or the concept of violence is difficult to understand to to, to to understand it is difficult to understand it because non-killing just do not kill that's it but even yeah it encompasses sexual violence as conceptualized by joan galton you see what i mean yeah. sexual violence i mean invisible violence you know so from page perspective this concept non-killing encompasses sexual violence as defined by 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 professor Galico. Okay. So as I hear you speak about Paige, you get so excited when you're speaking about like what his Paige, do Paige? Yes, because I mean him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you got to meet him because I'm like, there's such excitement there when you were speaking about the research. I was like, well, that Absolutely. must have, have been a transformative experience for you. Exactly. The, 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 the experience of Paige transformed me. When I meet Paige, Page, I mean, influenced my professor, Dr. Maxwell, and Dr. Maxwell transformed. And that is, I believe that this society can be transformed. Mm. Yeah, this society, where people kill, why do you kill others? Why do you spend trillion dollars, billion dollars to kill other human beings? Why? Why do Russia, the United States of America, Israel, France, UK, why do people to kill to destroy the planet? You're listening to Talk with Clads. Find more resources online at cladsresources.com. Now back to the show with your host, Katie Ann. And what, what your research right now would be so applicable or is applicable to what Absolutely. is going on right now. Like we have different wars that's going on, but I, I would be curious, like if they if this was something that was taught in schools, as, hey, let's look at versus the anti-nuclear weapons, 
let's look at non-killing solution first yes before the loss of loss of life so what you're doing right now is so so applicable to what's going on in the world so let's go back to transformative experiences so what are, I, I've heard about Dr. DuPage. I am seeing your excitement when you speak about it. So what were some of the transformative experiences you encountered during your research journey? And can you share some examples or stories that highlight the challenges and transformative experiences you encountered while working with like your realist or your anti-nuclear weapon act- activists or people who who will advocate for, for non-killing. And Dr. And DuPage is one of them. Good question. I think one of the most of the participants use used to kill before becoming non-killing figures or scholars. And they used to kill and they 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 didn't even know about the concept of non-killing before meeting Page. And they acknowledge that Page transformed their lives transform them from killing to non-killing. And I I interviewed someone who, a great scholar in the field of nuclear weapons. So he told, he told me when it, it was very difficult for him to accept this concept. And then when Pitch presented with some evidence that it is possible in the society <clears throat> where people do not kill, he said he he became convinced that this concept can this concept can be he accepts this concept in 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 his field and he wrote about it. So so many participants mentioned that, and that's why I, I as I just told you, I'm convinced that we can achieve a planet where there is no weapon to kill. We can have a non-killing political science. We can have a political science where non-killing is the foundation. Non-killing is the main value of this discipline. <clears throat> Not only uh, political science, even <clears throat> conflict, peace and conflict studies. Non-killing can be key value for this for our field because people think that they go, they they, they enter in war, they they use weapons against another country, this creation of conflict. You know, use weapon to kill others. That is a way of addressing conflict now. So non-killing supposed to be a key value in our field, peace and conflict resolution studies. Meaning what? It means that you are not going, I'm going to negotiate with you, but no killing, no killing, no weapon. We are not going to, to use weapon. That is the principle, the principle of of, of, of the basics of, of our discipline of social sciences. And Page mentioned that in his book that uh, we can achieve a non-killing global society if scholars like you, Kedian, students embrace the concept of non-killing. And that's why at the Center for Global Non-Killing, you, you have different research committees, international relations research committee, political science, Non-killing political science research committee, non-killing psychology, non-killing anthropology, non-killing international relations, and so on. All human beings supposed to try to, all scholars supposed to try to have to try to, I mean, connect this concept with their own academic disciplines. Oh, I'm I'm so happy you, you mentioned that. So can you discuss the role of education and awareness in promoting non-killing? How can individuals and communities be encouraged to embrace non-killing as a way of life? Because they always say, especially for Americans, that they, we always choose war. So how can we switch and how does education play a, a role in that? Listen, there will be non-killing. There is no non-killing global society without a non-killing global scientific project. Right. To have a non-killing global scientific project, we need to start educating people. Or in the non-killing global scientific project, we, project, we have to insert these aspects of non-killing education. Peace education is good, but non-killing peace education is better. 
Because yes. this is like, because you can hear people who kill or who, who, use, who, who use violence, they talk about peace too. As I mentioned earlier, if this person is not peace, if you want peace, people, people war. Prepare for war. This is complicated. So we need to educate. Me, what does that mean? We have the capacity to not kill, but you have to help them discover this capacity. Kill, yes, of course, you can kill, but you cannot kill too. You have the capacity not to kill. So that is the world of the education. Okay. So, education. so at that time, in the United States of America, in every school or everywhere in the world, they should initiate this concept, non-killing education. Because even in the movie that AIDS hey, watch, you have to initiate that. No, do not to kill. Do not, do not kill. Don't kill. So kill becomes normal. So non-killing should become normal. Yeah. In the minds in the mindset of of all human beings. We can achieve it. This is achievable. <laughs> so how do you see the concept of non-killing evolving in the future? Do you see any emerging, while you were doing your research, did you see any emerging trends or developments that you find particularly promising for use in I, the future? Yeah, I, there is a great feature for this concept as the world is at risk of killing every day, either or with nuclear weapons, climate change, a conflict in the Middle East and everywhere in the world, in Africa, there's a great picture. And there is, it is, there is a demand for that, for, for all of those problems, issues in the world. On the answer, the right answer for now, as you just mentioned, is not killing. That is why there's a great future for that. So even though some political scientists brief adopt, adopting or embracing the mainstream political science characterized by war, characterized by violence, characterized by killing, they will have later to embrace non-killing. They will not be able to keep killing others and they will have to choose non-killing as the men alternative to change this planet, to change the world, in the in the, even the structure, non-killing structure, non-killing institutions, non-killing political political parties, non-killing yeah. yeah. So the United Nations is the is a is a is a has I mean the foundation for social society that we are looking for. Mm-hmm. So what are some of the, as you you completed your research, what were some of the key takeaways or lessons that you learned? Like you're like, I I went and I I know I want to do my dissertation on non-killing, right? But, and my experience with DuPage has transformed my life. But what were some key takeaways that you you were like, these are life-changing moments for me? That can change that can change the lives for you for your personal experience. We were like this. So, for, oh, from my personal experience, yeah. Uh, I think <laughs> I would say three things. First, you have to read if you want to be a non-killing figures or scholars or whatever field you are involving. You have to train yourself to read about non-killing. That is self-education. Yeah. So meeting page was one thing, but to really become who I am or the non-killing figures I am, I had to 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 read most of the researches or most of the, the studies done by non-killing people. So for those who want again to embrace non-killing, the first thing they have to do is that's why my 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 work is important. Organizing workshop, organizing conference, organizing different. So don't be afraid of, don't be afraid of being attacked by others because you're 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 you're, you're promoting concept that can change the world. That is the, the way I can put it. If I try to to encourage others to embrace this this 
new concept, this new paradigm. Okay. Because no, no killing political science is about political science is about life. Political science is about life, you know. It's political science about life, organizing the society. So non-killing political science is a is a way to organize the society without resorting, without using violence to to address problems that we'll face. So based on your research, what are some practical strategies or approaches that can be employed to promote non-killing for a listener like me, like myself or for any of the listeners who listen to talk with clads what what can they do to they practices they can pr- employ to engage someone that is an anti-nuclear weapon activist or a realist to say hey let's think about the concept of non-killing yeah it is it is not easy to convince them people so we need to 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 be simple with that because the simplicity of the question is it on killing society possible show the complexity of of the problem of what we have we have to accomplish which is the not killing global society so when we are going to discuss that with scholars from other fields like anti-nuclear weapons or scholars in the field of realists or people who believe in war, we have to be simple with them and try to come with evidence to show them that a non-killing global society is possible. That page presents... So the, the book of page non-killing global political science is like a, a Bible for the field of non-killing political science. So we have to refer to this book and to 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 convince others so you have to really understand the concept and then try to educate others try to inform them that he or she has the the capacity to to become a non-killing leader or a non-killing scholar or a non-killing whatever you use just help them to discover this Capacity. That is the challenge, or that is what we have to do. If you want to approach someone who is not, who is a killer or, or a violent person. So I think the, the work of those at the center for global non killing, they have to think every day. And that is one of the, my recommendations for this center. So they have to think about a manual, I would say, book. To put the the work of page that can I mean convince others because the book of page is really philosophical. We need to put to write something simpler so that can convince others to 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 embark in the in the field of non killing of non killing political science or non killing. Yeah. So is that what's what's on what's up next for you? Are are we going to be seeing you creating that? Because you said it's needed. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm I thinking about it. There are so many others, so many other scholars who are also working about non-killing manual. They think about it. So we need to make it, to make it simple for everyone yeah. to understand because the world is very complicated. We can give them complicated reading that will make it more complex for them to to achieve, to embark in the in the process of accomplishing a non killing global society. Okay, I think the simpler it is, the, the easier it is to to understand and more relatable, actually, for everyone yeah. to understand. Scholars can understand stuff when it's really complicated, but I think like your everyday Joe Schmo, <laughs> a simple manual will probably help. So, what's I mean, you've shared such amazing information today. So, what's next for you? Next for me, for now, I'm looking for teaching op- opportunity, teaching in the field of peace, event security, conflict resolution, nuclear disarmament. So now I'm applying for some programs, for some fellowship in the U.S., in Massachusetts, and other universities. I'm waiting for the the answers, <laughs> what they will tell me, I don't know. So I keep applying and I keep writing. Academia is about publish or perish. So yeah. I, I I have some articles that have been accepted in some 
this tedious journal. So now I am I'm waiting for I'm wait, uh, I'm publishing in newspaper about my topic. Try to educate Asian community about non-killing nuclear disarmament, the threat of nuclear weapons, the threat of killing associated with the existence of nuclear of nuclear weapons. Actually, there are. 13,000 nuclear weapons in the world. Hmm. And then 1%, the use of only 1% can destroy cities. And then uh, we are in a very fragile moment in the, in the, pla- on, the on the planet. So we need to, 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 to keep thinking about how to mitigate those issues, those threats. So where could we find, if someone wants to connect with you, if a listener says, I'm really interested in learning more about Dr. Joseph and the, the concept of non-killing. So where would we be able to, where would they be able to connect with you? To connect with me if they want to know about the concept? Yes, and read your articles and so forth. Oh, yeah. I don't know if I can give my email. I don't know. There's a website at the Center for Global Non-Killing. There's a website. People can Google it and it's ccgnp dot i don't remember the, no, the website so they can google non-killing and they will find so many information so i don't have a website my own website maybe i'm thinking about it yeah so can they, they would find a lot of information about that and what about linkedin can they connect with you on linkedin yeah they can linkedin yes Roland joseph yeah they can connect with me on linkedin so actually i mean for now i have no Articles posted on my LinkedIn page. I will do it next, maybe in the next couple of weeks. I will try to post something related to non-killing and nuclear disarmament. So, but now the best way to know about non-killing is to go on the website of non-killing, of the Center for Global Non-Killing. They will find they will find a lot of resources. Even your psychologist, even your in the field of anthropology, international relations, law. Music, you will find something related to non-killing. Okay. Music. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah all of things. And page, there are more than 700 scholars or talent scholars connected from, I mean, 300 universities across the planet that are part of this center, Center for Global Non-Killing. Yeah. There are a lot of resources there. So what advice... Because you've been through the PhD journey. I'm like in it. <laughs> so what advice would you give to someone who wants to pursue a PhD? You have to really want to, to really know, okay, do I need a PhD? Because PhD means research. And then research, publish books, academic articles, opinions, whatever. So that is the first question. What field I want to? Peace and conflict studies, good for it. Political science, international relations. So the academia is not easy. People say that, and I'm, I'm experiencing that. <laughs> you can apply for professor to become an assistant professor. It will take time. You'll be to be hired, interview, maybe between three to even five, six months. They will interview you, presenting, lecture. It is very, very challenging. It's not easy. So we have to answer the questions. So if, when you get to the, into the PhD program, you have to be strategic. Finish your coursework and know how many courses per semester that you have to take. Manage family and, and academia. It's not easy. But what is important is communication. Communicate with your teacher or with your instructor, with your professor, with your faculty members. Communicate with them. And then if you have to postpone and if you have to ask for ex- uh, extension, you have to, you can ask the professor. So, okay, I had to submit my homework this week, but I cannot. So can you give me more days, more weeks to finish my essay? So communicate with your teacher. That is the main thing. So after that, prepare to take your, your, you have to prepare to get prepared to take the qualifying exam. One of the most important things, the qualified exam. Some universities, you can, you can take it maybe three times, some twice. And if you do not pass, they will give you a master's degree. 
So that is a, I was afraid of that. <laughs> so <laughs> you have to take your qualifying exam. That's one of, one of my experience that I like at, at the university where I studied. I got my, 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 my PhD. I went to a hotel and I spent maybe three days. I stayed in the hotel for three days to, 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 for the qualifying exam. I think so I'm going to gonna go that part. When I heard you say that, I was like, yeah, I think that's what I'm going to do when it's my turn. For your uh, qualifying exam? Yeah, I go to a hotel and just be on lockdown. You already took it, right? No, I have not taken it as yet. Oh, not, oh, not yet. Okay, you will. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that is interesting. And then don't forget to to think about your topic in your own way before you meet with your advisor. And one of the most important things is to Choose a chair that you will feel comfortable. I mean, a chair that you think you 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 are comfortable with. Not a chair that you don't like. You know what I mean. All chairs are important. They are good, but you have to choose one that you say, okay, for the types of topic, for the types of personality that I have, I have to choose this person. That is the one thing that 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 you one thing that you have to to. Another thing, I think in the committee, for the committee members. You have to choose all the committee members. I think they try, they, they should be in harmony. If there is no harmony between, if there is no harmonization between all of them, it, that it will be maybe difficult for you. Okay, to, that's you know? that's great advice. But I don't, I don't see how you can let. How do you let them be in harmony? No, be be careful when when you when you will talk to your first advisor. I mean your chair. They will, they, they will let you know that a little bit, but you have to be smart to understand. Yeah, got it. So, so I'm going to yeah. choose. Uh, he or she will tell you. In my, you will tell the professor. My community, I have Warland, I have X. Okay, Warland. Okay, <laughs> I to choose someone. Since we have the, since we see the professor, we ask those questions. You have to be careful. Yeah. I got it. Uh, and present a list of committee members and they will, okay, I think this person is good. Yeah. But okay, take Kedja, take Roland. Okay. Hope your committee is good. Yeah. You know? So when you choose some people that professor would feel not comfortable, that is another thing. Got it. You know, but always they are in discussion, they interact. They are, for your defense, they will never finish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God, that's great advice. So let me ask you this. Mm-hmm. Dead or alive. So you have a dead option or an alive option. Which three people have been the most influential people to you throughout your journey? And why did the first you first one was what is the first one? Dead if so you can choose someone that's either dead or alive. Okay. So top three. Which three people have been the most influential people in your life throughout your entire career path, educational path, you know, that specific journey? And why did you choose them? I think my mother. <laughs> he said, I think my mom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, my, my, mom, my mom is alive. Dr. Max Fall and my wife, they play well. You asked me to choose three? Three. Three. So, yeah. so you said you, yeah. cho- you chose your mom and you chose your wife. And, and that's actually a, a great decision for the non-killing section of it. <laughs> yeah, because my wife puts me a lot. Um, yeah. She always said, okay, well, then do what you want. You know? Yeah. And they always encourage me, okay, non-killing is a good thing. Uh, she never discouraged me in this in this way. <laughs> okay. And then what's the other, what was the, what was the last, you said doctor, I didn't hear, was that doctor? My, my, my mother. My mother is that of the Yeah, your mom? Yeah, my mom, my professor, Dr. Max Paul, and my I said my wife. Yeah, and your wife. Three great three great choices. So if you we've we've reached the stage, I say at the end of your story. Well, for this podcast, because this is not your full stop, right? So if you could ask one question that I did not ask you today. What would be that question and what would be your answer to that question? <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. What, what question I would say? I I didn't expect this question. So I think 
one question you should ask was I have to answer anyway. You have to answer it. You wanted it asked. I didn't ask it, so now is your turn to say I am the interviewer. You remember you have you you were a journalist. So which question do you want to you you said Katie and you skipped this question and I wanted to talk about it. Mm -hmm. I I I would tell I would say right now what why did it you why didn't you choose a topic related to Haiti? Ooh, that's a really good one. Yeah, uh, that's, yeah. Why didn't you choose a topic related to Haiti, but you chose non mm -hmm. That was that 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 should be my question. And what's so your answer? answer? And you have to answer it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> my answer will be like because Haiti is under the threat of killing. Yeah. Because if there's a nuclear war, Haiti will affect directly or indirectly. Directly because there are a lot of Haitians living in the United States. So if, if the United States of America has been attacked by another nuclear country or by another nuclear state, there will be a lot of Asian, Asian, a lot of people in the Asian community that will die or whatever they will affect by the nuclear radiation. So those Haitian people, they send a lot of money in Haiti that will affect the country. Yeah. So I think my topic encompasses to some extent the problem of the world, including my country. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's why choosing Haiti might not be it's a very good thing, but my topic encompasses also my dissertation encompasses also Haiti. Got it, got it, got so it. I, I, I am addressing the the world problem, not the the problem of a specific country. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I would love to have you back just to hear a little bit more about what's going on, like what your your thoughts are, especially with between Haiti and the DR with the whole canal thing that's going on. Would love to hear your, your viewpoint on that. And also with the political crisis right now in, in Haiti, with your dissertation on non-killing, how would you take that approach in Haiti? Yeah, I, 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 I started a project, working on a project on that, on a paper, I mean, to submit to an organization, you know, Haiti really need, needs the concept of non-killing. Yeah. It's called what now? Because so many gun violence in Haiti, Europeans is mm, difficult to, the situation is worse, become worse every day. And I'm from the southeast of Haiti. So every day I'm thinking about where I'm going to which way I'm going to use to go to my to my hometown, so to Jackmel. So it is very difficult. So and those gangsters, those those young people who who blocked Puerto Prince but now, they are they have been all in school. So developing a non-killing program in a high school, in elementary school, is the best thing that I should initiate in Haiti. Yeah. Feature, so we need that, and even though regarding the Dominican Republic issue, we are construct a canal in our side, in our land, and there is a, a the river is for us, is for the Dominican Republic, this is for Haiti too. So we are constructing a canal in our side, and Dominican Republic already constructed made so many, yeah, canals, so they. Political leaders, they need non-killing political science to non-killing politics. Yeah. So you, you know, see... To, to know that Dominican people, we are our brother and sisters. We share the island. We live together. Your problem is supposed to be my problem. My problem is supposed to be your yours. Even for the United States of America, even for Canada, even for France. This is such... This solidarity that we need to develop in the world. 
We are all connected, interconnected with each other. Yeah. We function, as prof our Professor Bernard used to say, as a system. We're a system. I mean, we are connected. When hate doesn't work, it will impact hate. They are. In United States of America or any other country. So yeah. many Haitians leave Haiti to come here. Yeah. Even by the bar, they can't. They can't. So if you help Haiti and Haiti help you, no, we have friends and have friends without dominating us. That is the world of conflict resolution. And that is why non-killing conflict resolution is important. It, it, it really is. We do not, we do not have to, to, to kill others e either directly or indirectly, directly and, or, or indirectly to, to the structure that you put in place. So your structure that you put in place supposed to be in the benefit of all others, of all people in the planet or village. That's why I think it's important that we need to, to, to eliminate all threats, including nuclear threats, all threats of killing, including nuclear weapons. And we should do that before those weapons eliminate us. Oh, yes. So if we do not do it together, we develop a sort of synergy to, to let, to help political politicians, political leaders, presidents, ministers, secretary of state, whatever, understand that they have the capacity to eliminate those weapons. Start living together. Start educating people everywhere in the world, from the very beginning to 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 university. Right from kindergarten to university. So you because see some some professors, some politicians, they need to be educated. So that is why, Doctor Joseph, it is very important for you to go out and do that manual. <laughs> we are, we are thinking. Yeah, it's very, very, very important for you to do that manual. It, it's you don't simplify it and get it out there, and because you've shared such a wealth of information with us, and it affect it affects us in so in all areas of our lives. If you think about it, mm -hmm. I, I will, I will, I will try to to bring something, make it simple as I can for the. I, I publish about in Haitian Creole. Because I want all people to understand, to understand. The community, and then I I will try to 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 publish some in English, in French for other people in in the world, in the US, wherever. Okay. Well, <laughs> well thank you so much. We we would love to have you back. We would love to have you back. So, but thank you so much for coming on and spending time with us and educating us about the concept, the non-killing concept, right? And sharing your dissertation, sharing your, your findings and your ideas with us. I am sure listeners enjoyed tremendously learning from you. So again, you're welcome back anytime. And thank you so much for taking some time to talk with CLADS. Thank you so much. So hope they will understand my accent. Yeah, <laughs> they sure will. <laughs> I have an accent. I have an accent. So in certain words, <laughs> it's, it's very difficult for me to to pronounce. I have to be like in my head going, oh, they say Jamaicans eat their eat the H. So when they say her, it's her. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. I, 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 it was amazing. Your questions. Thank you for your well, questions, so great, great, great questions. So I hope I will have uh, the opportunity to answer to more questions with it to non-killing in the future. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening and taking when, the... When, 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 when will we... It... Hold on. So thank you, everyone, for taking some time to talk with CLADS. Bye, guys. CLADS Resources and Consulting values its customers. Our Planner Footsteps to My Vision is a 13-month planner that can be used for five years. It walks you through SMART goals, SWOT analysis, action planning, and holds you accountable through three monthly check-ins. 
We work only with top quality materials, innovative designs, and verified suppliers, which are guaranteed to deliver to our high expectations because when it comes to our customer satisfaction, there's no room for compromise. Made with high quality PU leather and paper planner helps you focus on achieving your goals by giving you a sense of personal and professional satisfaction. Some of the amazing features of this product, vision board planner, luxury pen, eight gigabyte USB flash drive, wireless mouse, ultra elegant packaging box, available in five stunning colors, black, red, gold, pink, navy blue. Material, PU leather, 13 month planner, elastic band for easy handling. Our Footsteps to My Vision is available at Amazon, Facebook, Instagram, our website, and at Walmart. You may also follow us at www.cladsresources.com, Instagram, Clads Resources, Facebook, www.facebook.com forward slash Clads Resources forward slash. Thanks for listening. Find us on social media at Clads Resources and online at www.cladsresources.com. Our planner, Footsteps to My Vision, is also located on our website or on Facebook, Instagram, or Amazon. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share, and check back weekly for new episodes. Until next time, keep creating your footpath to your vision.